Okay. Just give it two seconds. We are now live. Yeah, we are now live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Live at Five. This is Solomon here. And uh, every week we have a very, very special guest from all over the world. This week we are exceptionally honored to have um, um, Valerie Best, who are the international judge, a very, very well experienced floral commentator as well as floral artist from the UK to join us. Thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you, Solomon. Lovely to be with you. Yes, and today we have such uh, a lot of subject to cover and we have a lot of insights from Valerie about like how should we see the future and, and the status quo of flower arranging as a scene, both in the UK as well as in the world. So how are you, Valerie? How's everything going on with the COVID thing? Well, it's uh, pretty dodgy here in the UK at the moment. Um, I think we're facing further lockdowns, which is a bit of a worry. But of course, it, it, it's different in every part of the UK. Uh, what they decided to do was to do regional lockdowns. So because we have four countries, uh, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, uh, the rules are different in every part and then depending on what part of the country you're in within that country uh, the, uh, uh, the rules are different and they, they seem to be changing fortnightly so at the moment we are looking like for me locally where i am in northwest london it is medium to high risk and then further north, it's more serious. And then over in the east of England, it's it's not so bad. But of course, it does have a devastating effect on social lives and on our flower clubs uh, within, within NAFAS, National Association of Flower Arrangement Societies, and all the clubs that we have in all four areas. Um, it's been a huge challenge since the beginning of the year, but um, it's exciting what we are doing to make up for that. Um, ne never put a flower arranger down because we will always find a way uh, through the problems and uh, what the flower clubs and also with the florists as well. Everybody is joining together to put through a united front so that we can continue with our flower arranging. It is amazing that we have seen such a, a array of different online uh, platforms as well as competition. We have seen a lot of online competitions we in have. the international group as well as online demonstration as well as like all the chit chat like what we are doing now, you know, exploring possibilities and assessing the status quo and all these kind of stuff would never have happened before the, 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 the pandemic. So I think it's, it's actually silver lining, isn't it? I think it's a huge bonus. And I think it's been a way of connecting people in that we've never had before. And we've been able to meet all our friends online and got to know more about each other and about the trends that we have going on in the different countries. Um, it doesn't seem that long ago that many of us were together in Jaipur for Wafa India. And it was great to meet up. And then, of course, as, as we were all coming home on the plane, uh, the restrictions hit almost universally. And we had to look for other ways so I think on the group that I run, um, which is now on its third name, um, International Friends of Floral Art and Design, uh, we, we elected to do an Easter challenge and we got some national demonstrators to do something. But at the same time, um, things were happening in New Zealand, uh, things were happening in the Ikebana groups. And all of a sudden we're beginning to meld 
all our different talents together so that we continue learning. And I think that's the most important thing that we have this opportunity to challenge ourselves and upgrade our skills. Oh, may I ask if, if, if anybody is interested in joining the group that you run, which is which has been so successful so far, and you've got so many talented artists as well as far ranging in that group. If people are interested to join that group, um, may I have the name of that again? Yes, it's International Friends of Floral Art and Design. Uh, originally, when the group started in 2010, it was put together by 10 of us who had uh, worked together for NAFAS in administrative roles. And we wanted to be able to keep our link going. So first of all, it was called NAFAS. Mm. And then NAFAS began its own social media. So we called it Friends of NAFAS. But now we have uh, almost 5,500 members in over 130 countries so i think it was time to move it on a bit and change the name so that we encompass everybody because we're getting um yeah it's really exciting the floral designs that we're seeing from around the group globe and seeing what people are doing and the trends that are evolving in different countries not only through flower arranging but with floristry as well so it's it's a good meld, it's a good blend. We have lots of florists, lots of flower arrangers, and lots of people in some countries, very small countries, who are just working in isolation on their own. So we hope that we can inspire them too. Mm. So if anybody's interested in having a look at this group and maybe joining the group if you are uh, 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 fulfilling the, the conditions of this group, you are very welcome to, oh, it's actually this side, this, this group here on the screen, International That's Friends it. of Floral Art and Design is actually the group that you actually need to join. So I've typed it out here. So if anybody is interested in joining this group, Valerie is actually the very, very excellent admin of this group, working tirelessly. Yeah, I, 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 I admin it. Yeah. I, I oh, yeah. admin it with David Ryan and we co-admin co with David Ryland and with my daughter Alex. Uh, the three of, uh, Alex is the technical expert and uh, David is a national demonstrator for NAFAS so he brings uh, another aspect to it. I, I'm the judging bit, he's the demonstrating bit and Alex does the technical side of it. So uh, you, if you want to join you just have three questions and hmm. the most important thing is like, like the, there are other groups like the flower arrangers group um the most important thing is that you're interested in floral design and that you do it it, it requires a lot of dedication so everybody please join this group here if you are interested thank and, you um, yeah so it's, it's it's actually very important for us with dedication and who are passionate about flower arranging or maybe floral design be yourself a flower arranger or a florist this is actually an exceptional platform for you to share and to learn as well as to give. And I think it's actually such an important thing. And we thank you so much, Valerie, for helping us to maintain such a high quality platform. Thank you. We, we did an amazing challenge when uh, lockdown started here in the UK that everybody from all over the world entered. And we just called it one flower, one leaf in isolation. And we had something like 300, over 300 different photographs from people in maybe 50 different countries who just did one flower, one leaf. And it was just, it was just fantastic to see what could be done with just that and nothing else. Mm. Yeah, it's actually quite, um, quite touching as well. I think, you know, it, it touches everybody's soul. In just, yeah. just that size, you know, just one flower and one leaf, you know, whoever, who would have thought that it actually ch touches people's soul and in, in such a times of crisis. It is, and I think that's what led to um, uh, several articles were in national newspapers here about the benefit of having plants and flowers in your life. 
and so Nafas have issued a, a new leaflet which can be downloaded from the website about the, the benefit of having flower arranging and plants and flowers in your life and I think that even here the supermarkets have picked up on it I think uh, that the uh, the growers the, the, the growers of the British cut flowers and all of our magazines um, so important that the Flower Arranger magazine, Flora magazine, Fusion Flowers have, have all picked up on this and uh, are emphasising the importance of plants and flowers to it to our well-being in everyday life. Exactly. Um, as we were talking about just now, uh, like we, we see the surge of house plants that we see in supermarket or maybe online. You know, it's all about house plants and how they actually interact with flower ranges in a domestic space. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that bringing the garden indoors, I think we've so enjoyed being uh, outside in our gardens during the summer because we've all been home. I think that bringing the garden indoors uh, is very, very, very important. And uh, I've noticed that in the supermarket, now they are absolutely flooding you with beautiful selection of bowls of flowers. And I've actually just done something that I never thought I would do. Um, during the summer, I collected a number of uh, different types of echeveria. And it's not something that I've had before. But, uh, uh, and just recently somebody gifted me one. Uh, the people viewing in the UK will know very well the names of Kevin Gunnell and Nick Nicholson. Uh, sadly lost to us now, but they were great plantsmen. And somebody just sent me recently a very rare echeveria called John Bunyan. It's the most peculiar thing with sort of warts on it. And uh, Nick had propagated it and distributed it around various people in Nafas. And I was highly delighted when somebody gifted me one about two weeks ago. And I suddenly thought to myself, now I have to decide what I'm going to do with all these echeveria that I've collected over the summer. So I asked David, because he's, he's the plantsman, and he said to me, well, you know, if you don't have a greenhouse somehow, you've got to bring them indoor. So we've just converted our conservatory, not our conservatory, but our porch in the front of our house is now full of echeveria and it looks wow. absolutely fantastic <laughs> and i would never have thought i thought i have to protect them through the winter um what prompted me to that is that we have a we have a new group here in the uk called botanical engineers Ooh. and using echeveria moss uh, all types of succulents and driftwood is part of their aim it, it goes with this sort of steampunk the theme that is very popular at the moment and so I'd been collecting these echeveria and I thought I can't lose them over the winter I don't have a greenhouse to put in put them in what am I going to do so there they are in the porch of my house and hopefully they will survive the winter wow that is absolutely fantastic and we can actually see how this uh, idea sort of like give birth to another one and I have heard about like this idea about steampunk that you have mentioned quite often. Is that is that a thing that we are a, a current theme that we are going through? Well, the new edition of the Flower Arranger magazine is out today with an article in it uh, by myself and my friend Kathy Stangard, who I I work a lot with, and I suppose I became interested in steampunk um about the middle of the 1990s and sorry this this shows up a side of myself that i'm probably not wanting people to know but i <laughs> i do like to, i do like to play a few online games wow. and um you know there are sort of things like dragon games and bakery story and design your own garden and sort of things like that. And about the middle of the 1990s, um, on one of the games, somebody had uh, put up a design for steampunk. 
And I thought, oh, that looks interesting. So I thought I'll, I'll do a little bit of investigation into this. And I became quite fascinated uh, with it. And around that time, Nafas had um, a speakers convention. We were, were I'm also a national speaker. We all got together at one of our symposiums. And uh, one of our national speakers, Joe Jacobs, uh, did a 10 minute talk on steampunk at, at my request. And everybody thought it was a joke. They thought <laughs> that she had made it up. But of course, no, it, it started in about the 1980s uh, from uh, an American science fiction writer. And basically it's mad Victorian scientists looks at the future it's about technology meeting victoriana and people dress up they have all whole themed events for them all around the world there is a whole city in or, or a town in new zealand that is completely steampunk and also one in america um mm. so it's a bit of fun it's about being a little bit crazy and it's about designing with a difference. And the botanical engineering group very much follow this theme of uh, steampunk. They have done a couple of exhibitions. It, it's quite sad, I think, that because of COVID, a lot of our big exhibitions and events have been cancelled uh, this year and put off for next year. But they had something very special uh, planned. But um, I do have here a little steampunk design. Ooh, wow. Design. Let me um, it, it, Yeah, you, you've got it there in the photograph, but I've actually enhanced it a little bit and added a few bits and pieces to it. So what it is, it, it, it's about the Industrial Revolution from the Victorian era. And what I've done is a petite design. It's got a, a few cogs, uh, a few watches and wheels and little bits and pieces in there. And then it's got the manufacturing industry, which was important from the Victorian times. So I've got cotton thread because that was a time when the cotton industry and the production of fabrics were so important here in the UK. So, uh, basically, you can steampunk any design and it's become a very popular theme here for weddings, for cakes, for events. And so if you want to be a bit wacky, a little bit different, it, it, it's not a period design because it's something that's ongoing and it's developing, but it is a little bit, bit crazy, bit funky do anything you like with it and um, enjoy designing in a different way. So we have, the article that's, uh, we have the article that's out today in the Flower Ranger with lots of ideas in it. And um, yeah, I also have here my mask, my steampunk Super mask. Cool. I have two of them. Yeah, that's the one. And this is based because part of it is um, science fiction. And so my masks, uh, if you've ever watched the series on the television Star Trek, uh, you will know the Borg. So Seven of Nine was one of the characters and my masks are based on uh, Seven of Nine, one of the characters and it, it, it again, this is where uh, the craft side of flower arranging uh, comes into it. You can incorporate this into your steampunk designs. And uh, my friend, Pretty Sada from Pushpa Britain Friendship Society in India, part of my team, India. Hello, girls, if you're watching. Um, all these beautiful dupe products, which have recently been coming out of uh, India, and I've used some of the uh, sheets of jute thread and I've twisted them up and wrapped them around with wire uh, to get 
the theme of the steampunk into my mask and as i say just just a bit of fun you can buy all the little cogs and the little implements you can buy huge bags of them on the internet through uh, ebay and amazon and uh, again just uh, a, a little bit of fun uh, during a crazy time nice to be a little bit different and do something different exactly now again you know uh, welcome to our live at five session with valerie best we've got so many of your fans coming in lynn barker lynn baker philippa crocker and um yeah. christiani duckworth all says hello and they oh christiana like yes hello christiana yeah and i can all see lots of my other friends i can see beverly Yes, yes well, they I'm are going to have to put my glasses on to see the names. Yes, exactly. That's fantastic. It's, it's all very loyal. Yeah, lovely to see of, everybody. Uh, yeah, so um, we never know until we have spoken to Valerie about the steampunk side of Valerie. We didn't know that. So um, how about um, something else? Like now that we are developing into this um it's actually quite interesting that the imagination can take you through the craft as well as the flower arranging as well as the plantsman side you know it kind of transverse through all this different area and where they converge is like one art form of its particular importance yeah i i love to um i love to experiment and i love to um find out about what's going on around the world as regards design. It's a little bit, if you like, if you think of music and you know immediately when you listen to a piece of music, uh, if it's got an American influence, if it's classical, if it's got a Mexican or uh, it's got a different rhythm or a beat to it. So to me, to research the history of flower arranging is uh, a very important thing and of course i did work for nine years uh, with india uh, but of course going back before then uh, i was very privileged to work with julia clements uh, she was president of the london and overseas area and there you can see uh, various photographs i love the one of her hands showing how she used you know a pin holder and that particular container which was a great favorite of hers and the original photograph that you had on there that was from the 1950s and then the one next to it that you just have up on the screen now is a photograph of julia demonstrating in america in 1980 and of course then we moved on to oasis but of course now we're moving back again to uh trying to arrange without the use of floral foam and we know oasis have got new varieties out but we we're trying different ways and i think that to get the full history of flower arranging and the influences of different areas around the world for for me that that's very important. Uh, NAFAS are producing an update to their period guide one uh, very soon. I hope it will be at the printers very soon. And we have two new chapters in it. One on the history of Indian design that incorporates uh, gardens and the history of flower arranging going back to uh, uh, the Buddhist monks and the start of Ikebana. And then we have another chapter on Ikebana itself, because I think these are all like, like different aspects of music. These are all different aspects of plants, flowers, flower arranging, how they're used around the world. And I think unless you get the full picture of what's actually happening, um, and for me as a judge, I think it's important that I know what's happening with artists in Mexico. I like to know about the uh, artists from Canada, 
there are seven landscape artists from a certain area in Canada and they have a particular style. I like to know about the frescoes of Italy. I like to know what's happening in South Africa and in New Zealand because all these are influences that are coming into floral design and they become our inspiration. And for me as a judge, it is important that I know about that. I, I, I need to look at a design and know where the influence is coming from. I, I think that is only fair to the competitor that as a judge that we have um, a full range of knowledge. So uh, moving on from that, I probably told you that I have three books that were recommended to me uh, by Kathy Whalen in the USA. And uh, one of my favorites is this particular book, Design for Flower Arrangers. Uh, I have three books written in the 1950s and they are my resource books these days along in the UK with books by Julia, books by uh, Jean Taylor. But I like to explore a bit more because the history of flower arranging is much more than just what happens here in, in the UK. Uh, I like to have a broader perspective on it. And uh, this book and this one written in 1952, uh, which I believe you can still get these books on the internet if you go on eBay. And these are my resource books. And if you ask me why, it's because they tell me aspects of the principles and elements of design that I can't find anywhere else. They give me uh, the history of dynamic balance which I can't get from anywhere else. And you find them in these older flower arranging books. So currently these are my exciting go-to books. I'm always looking on eBay and on Amazon to see what new books, what new old books are out that I can invest in because they give me the background of the flower arranging. Um, they also tell me what was going on in America in the early, early, in the 1940s and the 1950s. Um, and of course, really, uh, we, we think a lot of ha things, well, in your own country, you always think you're first with everything, don't, don't you? But, you know, there's this book on exhibiting from the early 1950s in America. And there's so much information in there and we have nothing like it anywhere else. So my american books are very important to me yeah it's actually very nice to um find new ideas from old books actually because now that we've got amazon and we've got such a wide range of books that you can search for, you know like retrospectively i i actually talk about books i actually found a book by um uh, sofu kashikahara that is actually the founder of the Sogetsu School of Ikebana. Right. And he has actually written a lot on how um, architecture as well as non-floral materials such as plastic and metals, how they can um, be amalgamated into, into, in, into mm. floral design. It makes things very, very exciting and modern as well as um, interesting. So, you know, I'm completely with you, Valerie, about like searching for new ideas from old ideas yeah. books and, and of mm. course you know with their all new everything new that's happening in social media we've been able to see different styles of ikebana that we've not been familiar with before um so many different sections um and then of course we have the 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 uh the four designers the ikinobo four recently mm. got together and I, I think to open up that so that we understand where our design comes from, because the one thing that Julia Clements always used to say was, Ju Ju Julia had two things in life that she always used to say. 
One was about life in general and one was about flower arranging. The one about life in general was that she never gave up hope on anything because she was always convinced that something would come along. So she never despaired. Uh, if she had to make, if she had to make her curtains, a, a, a blouse out of curtains, that wasn't a problem. She just utilized whatever she had around. So nothing phased her. She just thought something will turn up and it always did. But when it came to flower arranging, her advice was, don't overcomplicate it. Don't make it too much. She used to say that she would walk around a Navas National Show at staging time and she would see a lot of potentially brilliant designs. But by the time the competition, the staging time was over and it was time to judge, a lot of those designs had disappeared because we over complicate and I'm, I'm I'm the same myself if you go into the garden and you cut all your plant material and there you have it in front of you and you have a whole range of items you are desperate as a floral designer and as a florist to use what you have so you put a bit more in and you put a bit more in and you put a bit more in Julia never overcomplicated her designs. And that was always her message when she spoke to people. Now, I get a lot of people who regularly send me photographs of their work. And they say to me, please tell me how I can improve. Please give me your, your opinion on my work. Now, I'm delighted that somebody wants to ask me. They obviously feel that my opinion is important. But I think I would go back. I would say to anybody exactly what Julia said. Don't overcomplicate your design. Because the, the minute that you do that, you're losing the essence of what's you. If you feel you have to keep adding and adding and adding and I know this is because in the UK, particularly, we have a plethora of garden plant material, but you can overcomplicate the design. So uh, that was her message. And I repeat that message today. Don't overcomplicate your design. Is is actually um, quite quite an art, you know, how to just sort of just hit the right thing. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah, well, you know, we're, we're, there's two schools of thought, isn't there? Just, 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 but my husband's just said to me off the side here, you know, um, when in doubt, leave it out. And then there are other people, well, if it's in the, if it's in the bin, bung it in sort of thing. Because if it's there, you want to use it. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it is, you know, I would say, it, yeah, don't overcomplicate it. The art of refining your design, I think, it, it is important. I, I think it's actually quite a um, modern way now to sort of like try to incorporate the sort of Eastern minimalist with, as well as the what, what they call like a Western, almost like an oil painting, like, like a painterly effect with a minimal approach. Um, yeah. It's actually quite quite de rigueur at the moment, but it's it's just hitting the balance because we see so many different pictures online every single day, every minute there are new things putting out and how do you access it and how do you sort of uh, judge it and analyze it is actually quite an art in itself. Do you know that's that's been incredibly hard yeah. uh, because the exhibitors with going entering online competitions it's been a challenge for everybody so they are having to learn how to photograph their designs and the judges are having to have to learn how to see it three-dimensionally from a two-dimensional photograph and it, it it's not easy so I think the biggest learning curve for me, like 
well, on, on our group, we, we've done a few competitions uh, this year. But the biggest learning curve for me was the South African Flower Union recent uh, virtual show that they just did. And I think they had something like 20 classes and over 400 exhibits. And wow. Kim uh, Zimmerman, who organised that for them, who is based now in the UK, uh, she got together various panels of judges. So I think altogether we were, uh, there were over 50 judges in panels of three. And it was very interesting how we got together and discussed what we were looking at. And as it went through the classes and Kim, and Kim was putting up the photographs of the exhibits and we were getting the judges' comments, there were things that hit me that reminded me of what Julia said, don't, don't overcomplicate something. Because uh, the, one, the one exhibit that stood out for me, and I think I mentioned it uh, on social media at the time, was the uh, Merle Christie's Black Hole, which was an unbelievable design was so very clever with not only her interpretation, not only the components she used, but how she photographed it. And it was a two-dimensional photograph, but she made the photograph look three-dimensional. And I thought that was the biggest lesson that I learned from that, that if you are very clever in entering an online competition, you can take a two-dimensional photograph, but if you have been clever with your components, you can make your design look three-dimensional in a two-dimensional photograph. Now, that is an art that I think we are all exploring, and I think we are going to get better and better at it because we don't know how long COVID is going on for. We don't know when we are going to meet. Uh, in this country, in the UK, uh, because of the various rules, some halls are seeing flower arranging as being educational and they are allowing groups to meet. Yeah. Uh, some are not. Uh, today, Cathy Stangard has got her, her group meeting uh, where, where she lives and she's going to do a video for later on today on, on how they're making it work so that we can see how you can have a class working within, within regulations. But because nearly everything has been cancelled till next year, I see us going through the rest of the, win the UK winter, spring, spring elsewhere in the Southern Hemisphere. But I think we're going to be going on to the end of March with online demonstrations and online uh, virtual shows because we have to keep everybody enthused and on board and excited and stimulated with new ideas and I think that these virtual competitions are the way to do it and I think that with that we are going to improve not only our floral art skills but we're going to improve we're going to improve our photography skills as well. Now, here's an interesting question. I just got a private message, which is uh, very, I think, potentially contentious, you know, is saying like, um, it's, it's actually the same with painting and photography, really, is, is the argument between that. Is photography the message, the medium is the message, or the flower is the message, or how would you prioritize that right this this is really interesting because uh in some judging groups that i'm involved with online we we talk about this and in the in the first competitions that we did um i had to say to the judging groups we're not judging the photography we mm. are not we are not we are judging the flower arranging exhibit. We are not judging the photography. But all of a sudden, there's a fine line, isn't there, between the two? 
what when is the photography influencing the judge and and i have to say I, I i'm the first one to put my hand up and say if it's a better photograph that that influences how i'm looking at it as a judge and i'm trying not to i'm trying to judge the exhibit by the principles of elements of design but i have in front of me and i'm thinking oh if only you dined that drape or if only you'd put a better background colour behind it um, because as Kim would say if you put a black background behind most designs in a photograph it, ble it bleeds it out it bleeds the colour out and it doesn't look so good whereas navy blue as a background is actually slightly better than black because it's not it's not bleeding out the colour and there's not an answer to this yet because we're still in the learning process of it uh, but I think that with every virtual online competition, uh, the arrangers that are entering, I've, I've just had a few uh, messages, I've had a few emails this week with designs, and I've noticed that the photography is improving. So if the photography is improving, that, that, that's good. That, that makes it... Uh, an extra dimension and we're, we're learning something extra from it but as a judge i am trying not to let the photography influence me i'm trying to look at purely the flower arrangement and do it as i normally would when i when i enter when i enter a hall and there's a, a row of exhibits in front of me yeah um here in 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 asia there are some similar shows as well so what they're doing here maybe is an idea is that they they will submit photographs but since pictures um taken through the lens of the camera so you're being set at a certain angle fixed angle yeah. through the eye of the photographer that you're viewing the, the the thing which is good and sometimes they supplement it with a short video of the entire arrangement yeah. so that might help judging too i think what we're what we're what i'm currently asking people to do is uh for a virtual competition is to send in one photograph of the complete exhibit mm. and then send in a close-up of a yeah. particular part that perhaps you you know you want to get a uh a, that you want to emphasize to the judges or maybe be, because not everything shows in a photograph and maybe you want the judge to see uh, a particular part of it mm. uh, it's it's hard it's hard for the um uh yeah it, it's hard for the exhibitor to to know uh, am, I, am I photographing this co correctly? If, if you are doing it on your iPhone, if you're doing it on your iPad, or you have a better camera, is it making a difference? Um, maybe we look at a virtual show where we have, where we have a class, uh, these exhibits only photographed on your iPhone, so that nobody is having an advantage. I don't know. It, it, all these questions are, are going to come up and we are going to have to discuss them because I think they're going to go on and on. And uh, we we have here in the UK, uh, Scumthorpe Flower Club have a Skype group um, where they meet, they meet every week and they look at their exhibits uh, re really through the eye of the photographer. So, you know, we're going to learn. It's a learning curve for all of us, and a challenge. And it's actually, yeah, and 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 it presents limitless possibility because yeah. the rules are not set yet, and it's almost like another galaxy of ideas that people can experience and explore. And um, I think you know, like you said, you know, it actually is an is is a horrible time as well as an exciting time at the same time now. So. Mm -hmm. um, lots lots to explore
So now if we come back to uh, what we were talking about is that in the group that um, the Valerie has been judging a lot of uh, flower arranging and there's a new article coming out talking about steampunk as well as yep. your collection of Echo Vera. What do you think will be the future of our titles of, of exhibitions? What, what, what do you think will be the future trend for exhibitions and stuff like that? Right, I would like to see, because with the virtual online shows, we are giving people the choice. Um, we, we're giving a title, but we're saying size, and specification to suit yourself. I would like to see a few shows with no rules. I I would like us to think else. Yeah, I would like us to think outside of the box. Uh, a little bit. Again, if I go back to music, and somebody picks up a guitar and suddenly plays out a tune, you know. Let, let's be spontaneous. Mm. That's what I want to see. I want to see out, out of the box designs, some more spontaneity. And I think one of the ways around that will be when we get back to eventually back to our clubs and we get back to classes, um, maybe we should think about how we're teaching flower arranging. If you start and you're going, it's a traditional class, maybe we want to mix it up a bit. Maybe we want one week and a bit of Ikebana, one week we want a traditional design, next week we want a com contemporary design. If we give people the option of a full range of what the flowery raging world has to offer, we will actually get in shows better exhibits. We'll get better standards, we will get more free flowing, free, free thinking designs. Um, we will get, we will get more Gregors and we will get more Hitomi Gillians coming out. We will get more Solomons. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's a good idea, but you know, there you go. <laughs> I think I think it's absolutely an exciting idea because it's like almost like paint, or it's almost like like you learn different school and then you kind of like regurgitate your own style mm -hmm. if that you digest it and then you regurgitate and then it's something that you can claim to be yours and um it's it's, it's ever so exciting you know that that valerie has come up with this idea it's like about spontaneity it's it's almost like it's almost like the philosophy of being a surrealist you know just just let your unconscious guide you like what you want yeah. to do yeah yeah, yeah we then, I, there <coughs> excuse me there used to be a, a show here we used to have a dahlia grower um uh, just up uh, just not very far from me and uh, they used to hold an annual show and although they had titles you were able to go and cut your plant material from everything that they had and so you couldn't pre-plan your exhibit you might have had a brief idea but then you you were allowed free reign you you paid a price to enter the show and then you could go into their gardens and you could cut everything how fantastic is that that you could just go it was uh Aylets, the the, the uh, dahlia growers and I think they stopped doing it quite a number of years, but I'm sure there'll be a few people in the UK will remember the ALEX shows. And you you could just go and cut what you wanted. And, and then it became spontaneous because you didn't know what you were going to see. You didn't know what dahlias you were going to choose. And so you had you had to be spontaneous in your design. Mm. I'd, I'd like to see more of that. Yeah, it's it's very exciting, and that's why flower really, it's it's what flower does to you, isn't it? It's like because yeah. it excites you, inspires you every day. You know, we can never get bored of it. Yeah, I think I, th I think the spontaneity. You know, let's let let's do that. Let's do that. I think I think we look forward to seeing that in the in the international friends of floral art and design group having well, one of the 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 ones that the the section that I personally have learned 
more, most from has what, what when I used to do this was my junior flower club and um, I think over a period of about 30 years I must have taught something like over 3,000 children uh, craft and flower arranging and I used to incorporate the two and the funny the strange thing was that the first thing that I would teach them when they came to class was to do a petite design yeah. or a miniature because I think if you could reproduce that then that gave you an insight into the principles and elements of design almost immediately and then you could then scale it up and they used to like doing these small scale designs that it was very, very, very good for them. And I found that from teaching eight to 16 year olds, I learned far more from them than they ever learned from me. Uh, they, they taught me spontaneity because I had two or three whose sense of design was way beyond anything that I, I could ever hope to achieve. And that, that's where you learn for, from, from the children. Wow. So I, I, I hope uh, we, we just had our NAFAS AGM and one of the questions at the end of the AGM was about uh, group groups for juniors, which we used to do a lot of, but a sort of um, it sort of disappeared a little bit and maybe maybe we ought to go back to that and start promoting what we can do for uh the eight to 16 year olds and so that we don't lose them when they're 16 because that's what happens here in the uk they they go to classes from eight to 16 then after that there isn't anything for them we don't transition them into our, into our general yeah. flower clubs, which is maybe what we should look at. And I was just um, I was just looking at uh, something today. I, I have actually the mother of this young man is coming round to me later on this afternoon to collect this because this has been in my cupboard for goodness knows how long. So wow. this was best in show at the RHS Chelsea Flower Show Junior Gallery in 1999. And it was put together using a technique that I call embroidery with plant material. And it was something that I involved uh, called a, a mosaic style which has been used many times since. And Ashish was 12 at the time. And it's his birthday tomorrow. And I think oh. he'll be 33. Wow. And he's got a family of his own. And his, his mum is coming round to collect this yeah. from me the, the soft, later on this afternoon to give to him. It has been in a tin for over 20 years and it's wow. come out of the tin and it is still in perfect condition. Wow. So, uh, yeah, you, you can see that that was the year at Chelsea where they had to do um, uh, a heritage design. Um, they had to reproduce something and he found this. And this was actually exhibited alongside uh, the original artwork of the person that designed uh, this, this family uh, emblem. And it, it was so good, you could barely tell the difference uh, between this and the, 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 the original artwork. So uh, this is when I say that children have this ability to teach you more then you can teach them if you have an open mind. So uh, hopefully we can see more junior flower clubs uh, starting again. There used to be one in Hong Kong. I don't know if that still exists, but that was... Yeah, it still exists. It still exists, yeah. 
they yeah, used yeah. to be doing to London and overseas, and they used to do amazing work there. Yeah, yeah. But it, I it, it's, the it's a long time since I've seen what they do. So I, I would like to see, I would like to see the juniors back in. Mm, yeah, I, I think that's the future because it's actually very important to kind of like you said, you know, how, 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 what, what are they going to do after when they're 16? Maybe they just get a job and forget about flower arranging until they are slightly, you know, more comfortable. Well, I think so. But again, back to music, you see, you learn music in school, but when you're 16, you don't forget your music, do you? It's part of your oh. life. That's very you carry true. it on forever. Why, why, why can't we continue uh, the love of flowers, gardening, floral design? Why, why can't we have some way where we we, we continue that? So old ladies, not so old ladies like myself, are not doing it forever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you so much for ha having us, like you know, like all, all maintained on a platform and everything. You know, it's all organized and we have regular shows and regular judging sessions and regular talks to keep us up to date and everything else. You know, thank you so much, Valerie. Yeah, I'm uh, just looking at something that Alison Bradley has just put up. The wonderful thing about working with children is that they have no fear of color. And I, th I think that is true. They have no fear of color. And they experiment in ways that, you know, we, we are very stereotyped in the way we look at colour. And I think that's it. And I, I think I would agree with Alison. That's one of the things that, that, that I learned from them. That the, their use of colour is very original. They're, they're not worried about what they do with it. Um, is is colour something that people should be worried about? No, but there are sort of unwritten rules, aren't there? Ah, oh, I see. I see. <laughs> there, 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 there are unwritten rules about colour that, that go back with, with cultural influences. Um, and what one of the things would be, here. It, I'll just give you one example, and it's a very silly thing here in the UK, and, and, and until jewellery changed it. Never put silver and gold together. Oh, really? Okay. Yep yeah, that that that's an old an old old thing. Never put silver and gold together. But then suddenly the jewellery industry changed their perspective on that, and now you get silver and rose gold and yellow gold is all put together. The other thing that that you would have, what was taught in a flower arranging class here when I first went was. Never put yellow and yellow and red together. Ah. No, no, dear. You never arrange yellow and red together. Uh, they're they're too harsh. And then when you're in the hall in a competition, uh, the the fluorescent lights bleed the light out of the yellow and make it look brown. So never put yellow and red together. Why not? Why not? You know, if you're clever. You put a little touch of lime green in it, don't you? And you soften it, and you put a little touch of white in it. So, you know, there, yeah, there are unwritten rules that going back for years in flower arranging that you need to get rid of. So, I, I think it has to be a, a cultural thing. It has, it, like, different cultures have different expressions of colors. As well I'm as being form. very diplomatic in not mentioning any color trends from around the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, Valerie. You know, it's been an immensely intensive uh, knowledge. Uh, what, what can I say? You know, like a like a huge information uh, uh, session this time. You know, within one hour, we went from steampunk all the way to the history, as well as in the future. And thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you. I loved it. Thank I was very really nervous thank you about for... it, but I've loved it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much. It's been thank such you. an honor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Let me stop it first. <laughs>